a little more brief today. I went way over last week. I think we were in the close to 12.30 or something, but that was, wasn't my fault. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, Sheila, if you can, find the King James. I mean, I know we're in, a in this other one, but that's okay. Uh, what, he said, what he's saying here in the King James, the way it's translated is, study to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. James talking about the word, you know, and that's, that was a powerful <coughs> testimony. Yes, but he said, study to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, all right? Yep. So Paul didn't tell Timothy, you know, find something to teach or preach that's going to disqualify people or point out their faults. He told him to study to show himself approved. Not rejected, not disqualified, not a failure, but approved. He said, study, search these scriptures and find your approval. Find that you have been approved. Not find what's wrong with you, not find with all your faults and your failures, but find yourself approved of God. Right. Amen? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if there's a right way to divide the truth, then obviously there must be a wrong way to divide the truth. And he's telling us if you rightly divide it, you're going to find out that you're approved of God. Yes. Now, if you're finding yourself guilty and, and judged, then you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. You're missing the message. Praise the Lord. So, rightly dividing the word of truth isn't just learning how to dissect scripture. Right. It's not just about learning Greek or Hebrew or something and then being able to, you know, it's, it's not uh, learning how to dissect your theology. Or, In fact, the, the truth is, the Spirit of God changes theology to experience. Yes. Now, we've heard Tim say this often and, and different... Ones of us, I'm sure, have, have said this ourselves. That once you have an experience in God, you can't take it away from you. You can take religion away from you. You can change your religion. And most of us have been in and out of different religious groups. Because we're trying to find the Spirit. We're trying to find God. Not just another duty to fulfill or an obligation to keep. So if you have... The Spirit of God, it will define your theology. Yes. It will take care of that for you. Yes. Amen. So look at John uh, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 13, please. That's why you have professors, you know, in uh, colleges, universities, and the like, teaching theology. They have no spiritual experience. They have theology. They may know the theology and they can quote the scriptures and they can give you their, their uh, take on it. But it's the experience of the Holy, it's the Holy Spirit that create, makes that an experience, not just a mental uh, exercise. Yep. Praise the Lord. So how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear... That shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing how to discern uh, what is true in relationship to the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Right. Rightly dividing the Word teaches us the Old Covenant was a government of condemnation. Doesn't take you very long to figure that out. Read uh, Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus, and you see it's all about yeah. judging. Yeah. Amen. Condemnation. Well, the New Covenant is a government of affirmation. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. You can see it distinctly in the way the covenants are set up. Yep. Amen. It's all about you in the old covenant, what you have to do, what you have to measure up to in order to be accepted. Right. In the new covenant, it was all about him. Yeah. He's already done it. You don't have to do anything except to believe, amen, on him whom God has sent. Praise the Lord. So look at this now. Uh, 
Philemon 6. And it's pretty well laid out here that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. In other words, the way you share your faith is only effective by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ. You cannot effectively share the gospel without knowing that every good thing is in you because of Christ. So if you're guilty and condemned and, and uh, judged and critiquing yourself all the time and judging yourself, you're not going to be able to share the gospel. You're not going to be able to share the good news, amen, that God wants us to share, amen, that he told us we are to be reconcilers, right? Okay, so look at the Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So, according to this scripture, anything that isn't edifying or graceful is corrupt communication. It's bogus communication. You're communicating something that is not true. It's corrupt. It's defiled. It's messed up, right? So, in fact, in the new t uh, under the New Covenant, you, f you see that to prophesy, Paul talks about being all of us prophesying, that all should prophesy. And then he goes on to tell us that the prophecy, any prophecy that comes from you has to be edifying, it has to be encouraging, it has to build up, right? There's no negative in this because it's all about edifying, it's all about building up, it's all about encouragement, it's all about... It's good. It's all good. Praise the Lord. All right. So the new covenant is edifying and it ministers grace. Right? All right. John chapter 13, verse 36 through 38. John 13, 36 through 38. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither, thou, whither, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered him, whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice, or three times, right? So in John 13, Peter thinks he can lay down his life for Jesus. He says, he thinks, I can do this. I can, I can make the total sacrifice. I can make it, and it'll work. Praise the Lord. But Jesus tells him, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Right? So if that late, are you, really, you think you're going to lay down your life for me? I'll tell you what, Peter. Before the sun comes up, you're going to have denied me three times. Right? So... What's, what's interesting here is, look at, let's go to chapter 14 and we'll read verses 1 through 3. Because remember, there's no chapters and verses when this is written. It's continuous writing. Mm -hmm. So we put this stuff in to, supposedly to help us out, but usually it confuses us. But let not your heart be troubled. So he says, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. Then he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Which is how this conversation got started in the first place. Jesus said, I have to go away. He says, I want to go with you. Right. And he says, you can't go with me now. But later you'll be able to come. Right. Peter says, hey, I'll I don't know what it's going to cost, but I'll pay the ultimate price. I want to be with you. And Jesus said, no, you'll deny me. And then he goes on to say, but let not your heart be troubled. So let not your heart be troubled. So, so you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail. Right. Right. He knew it before he ever opened his mouth. He knew it before the conversation even started. He knew Peter was going to fail. Yeah. So he tells him in advance, you're going to fail. Oh, really? You're going to give your... No, he said, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. But don't let your heart be troubled. Right. 
just because you fail. All right? Don't get into guilt. Don't get into condemnation. If you believe in God, believe me. Don't let your heart be troubled by your failure. And then the rooster crows. And most of us have heard this preached that the rooster just crowed to rat Peter out. Because he didn't do what he was gonna, said he was going to do. You know, he failed. He was a flop, you know. Or it's kind of a, I told you so, you failure. Told you. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way we would react. Told you you were going to do that. I knew you. I knew this. I know you. I knew you were going to do it. Told you. But that's not the way it works. Because anybody who's ever lived on a farm, anybody who's ever been around chickens, knows that the moment a new day begins to break, now I know they crow at different times, but we've got chickens just up the road, and I hear them all hours of the day, but they begin before dawn. First thing in the morning, the chickens begin to crow. A new day is dawning. Mm -hmm. Amen? It was one where the Father and the Son would come to live within us. Right? I'm not going to get into all the debate about this, this, and this, but they come in that one spirit, mm -hmm. which is God, yeah. which is the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do a whole lot of mental exercising here to realize, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is right. one. Yes. Praise the Lord. So it's like an alarm clock. Uh, the rooster crowing is like the alarm clock saying, it's a new day. Yes. Get up, let's get with it. It's, it's, yeah. The new day has started, okay? And this rooster is announcing a new day. Yes. Amen. A new day was dawning. It was the one where God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, were going to come and dwell within mankind. That's what Jesus was pronouncing. Amen. That's what the rooster was pronouncing. It's a brand new day. Praise yes. the Lord. Amen. And it's going to empower us to be what we could never be yes. on our own as humans. Right. Sinless, faultless, yes. perfect, accepted, beloved. Amen. Because yes. everybody has failed. Yep. Right. I mean, some even failed this morning. I think Sally failed this morning. <laughs> I'm not positive. I think that was this morning. Yeah. Just saying. Everybody fails. We've all heard the rooster crow. Yes. She just heard it. Yeah. <laughs> but let not your heart be troubled. Yes, right. You're living in a new day. We're all yes. living in a new day. In a brand new covenant, yes. amen, where you become the dwelling place of God. Yes. I mean, this is amazing yes. if we just think about it a little bit. Yeah. We have become... The house of God. We have become the dwelling place for God Almighty. Yes. Praise the Lord. Why then would we not have respect for one another? Amen. Amen. Why would we not love one another, even with our faults? Because you are God's representation. You are God's house. You are God's, yes. you know, tabernacle. Yes. And when I like, I, Paul said, when I look at you, I see God. That's what yes. I'm supposed to see. That's all we're supposed yes. to see when we see one another. We don't see our flaws. We all got them. We know that we have them, but that's not what we're supposed to be focusing on. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. We can live the abundant life right now. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Now, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further here. So I'm not denying the reality of heaven as a, actually a location. It's a spiritual thing, and, and, but we're going to see it. We're going to experience it. We're, we know that we are because the Scripture tells us we are. But sometimes we look at things from that perspective and we miss what it is that God's trying to tell us about the right now, right. the here and the now. Amen? Right. So look at John again. Let's go to John 14, 1. And I'm going to read the first 14 verses. We'll just read the whole thing. John 14, 1 through 14. So he says, let not your heart be troubled. Now we know the context here is Peter just failed. And he says, don't, but don't let that destroy you. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, 
there you may be also. Again, remember, that's the context of how this whole conversation got started. Peter wanted to go with him, mm -hmm. right? So whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now get the context here. See, he's talking about something different than what they're talking about. They're not quite grasping what the depth of this information or revelation that he's given him. He said, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth us. He said, you're looking at him. You're looking at the flesh representation of that father. Right? So Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Jesus is the only God you're going to see. God is a spirit, and no man has seen him. So God comes into this earth in a human being, in a man, and that's the God that you're going to see in heaven or anywhere else. Right? So he says, I've been to the, show us the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now think about this for a minute. Jesus is giving us a picture of us. Yeah. See, God is in me. Yes. Now it's difficult because I know me. But he said, I've declared you righteous. Therefore, I can dwell within you yes. because you are spotless without sin. Yes. Now, if you don't believe that you've been forgiven, then there's no way you can believe that God can dwell in you. Right. Because we know God will have no part with sin. Right. He and sin don't take up the same space. Right. So we have to be spotless. Yes. 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 Amen. I'm looking at perfect people. Yes. I mean, without sin, spotless. In the eyes of God. Because God is dwelling in you. That's right. right? So this is the picture Jesus has kind of given us. The Father's in me. If you see me, you see the Father. He's telling us this is what you're going to go. This is where you're going to come to at some point. Okay? So verily, verily, I say that he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now, we struggle with that sometimes, but that's, we'll get to it here in a minute. But he's giving us the full picture of who we are in Christ, right? And so whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. All right? Now, we are, he is the firstborn of many brethren. We are all the offspring of God once we get born again. We are sons of of God. No, not gender specific here, but we were all children of God, right? So he says, in my father's house are many mansions. Not your house, the father's house. In the father's house are many mansions, right? So it's about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of us. Praise the Lord. It's not where you're going to live. It's where God is going to live is what he's talking about. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not denying heaven. I'm not saying that that isn't a genuine, real thing that everybody's going to experience. I'm talking about the here and now, and that's what yes. Jesus was talking about. Yes. I have to go away. Once I go away, then you can go where I am. Where am I? I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. Yes. Right? And then he wraps the whole thing up in another place where he talks about I and you, you and me, we and God. That's yes. the sum total or the summation of everything that God's doing, right? Yes. So he's telling us it's not where we're going to live. It's where God is going to live. When the Father and the Son dwell in us, they bring heaven to earth. Yes. They bring that dimension that realm, yes. that spirit world, yes. here. Yes. It's called the kingdom of God. Yes. But it's here. It's wherever we are because God is in us, right? Yes. So we are what gives God. Now think about this. God is omnipresent, is he not? Yes. 
We're what gives him a local address. He is everywhere, but he's also resident right here. Amen. This is his local address. You got something you want to say to the Lord? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Just give me an email. Hallelujah. Just drop like a little note in here and God will get it. Right? Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does it happen? It happened when Jesus came to the earth and did only the will of his Father. Praise the Lord. All right. John 14, verse 6. Praise the Lord. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right? Now they're asking, where are you going? We don't know. He said, I, you know where I'm going. You know how to get there. And they said, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know how to get there. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. He's telling them, I'm going back to the Father. Amen. And one of these days, and before too long, because I'm going to the Father, I can send back the Spirit of God, and you can go where I am. Where I am right now. Right? Praise the Lord. So, these are the words to watch in this whole chapter, in fact, is I am. Because it's repeated over and over and over. He said, I am where I am, you may be also. Right? right? And then verse 10, believe thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Yes. Right? So, John 13, 36. I am, I am. He's given us information. I mean, he's giving us insight. He's already said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Right? I am. I am. I am. He keeps repeating over and over. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus said and answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Amen? So, <laughs> praise the Lord. The question is, where is he? Because wherever he is, that's where he's taking you. All right? John 14, 3. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Praise the Lord. The answer is, he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. So then, the place he has prepared for us to be is in the Father and the Father in us. Yes. That's what Jesus prepared. That's what he made possible. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So then, the place he has prepared is the Father. Praise the Lord. That's what he yes. came to prepare for us to restore us to sonship. Yes. Yes. Back to where we were before the foundation of the world, which is in Christ. Yes. Who was in God. I and the Father are one. Right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. Or God put on flesh and dwelt among us. He's taking us back where we came from. He's prepared the way back to our original intent, which was to be one with God. To come from God. To come out of God and to be one with God. So, John 14, verse 18. Now, this is interesting because we're going to, we've got it in the King James here, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you another. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That word in the, uh, in the New King James Version is translated an orphan. You can read it. He says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But what he really is saying, the, tr the closer uh, translation actually says, I will not leave you orphans. Wow. Praise the Lord. Comfortless. Mm -hmm. Orphans. Mm -hmm. 
I will come to you. Yes. Praise the Lord. See, we are not orphans. No. We have a father. Yes. We're no longer servants. But sons, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Yes. All right, John 16, verse 7. He's telling us now why he's going to go away, why he has to go away, right? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. Because if I go not away, the comforter will not, comforter will not come to you. I will not leave you comfortless. Right? I will not leave you orphans. I will not. I have to go away. For if I go not away, daddy will not come to you. Your dad will not come. Your father cannot come to you. Right? But if I depart, I will send him to you. God is a spirit. Amen? So Jesus tells us the reason for going away. If I don't go away... Your father can't come. Uh -huh. You'll remain an orphan. Right. Comfortless. Amen. See, we're not serving an absentee father. No. He is a very present help yes. in the time of trouble. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you comfortless. I'll never leave you orphaned. Right. I'm your forever father. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, John 14 again, 18 through 20. John 14, 18, 18 through 20. What manner of love the Father has for us that he gave this price to get us back, yes. to have us as sons again and not as orphans, separated. Right. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live, you shall live also. At that day... You shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Praise the Lord. The end result, then, is John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now, we know why he went to the Father, right? Amen. The reality of rightly dividing the word of truth, of truth amen, we are now in the Father, and He is in us, and nothing shall be impossible, amen, to them that believe. Right. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. Now, He's already told us He was in the Father, the Father was in Him. Now, He said, I'm going to give you the same thing back to where you were supposed to be initially, amen. You're going to be in the Father. The Father is going to be you, in you, amen. We're going to be one. Praise the Lord. And Jesus told us already. He said, I can't. Don't, don't look at me. He said, I can't do anything. It's the Father that's in me. He's talking about the man now. He said, the man can't do anything here. It's the Father that's in me. He's the one that does the works. He's the one that does the miracles. And that's why Jesus said, I'm going to my Father. Amen. Because I go to my Father, you're going to do greater works than you've even seen me do. Because the Father is going to come and dwell in you exactly the way He dwelled in me. And you can do the very same works of Christ, amen, if you believe, hallelujah, if you rightly divide the word of truth and understand who you are in Christ, nothing shall be impossible. You will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You can cast out demons. Amen. All of these things that Jesus did, you can do and greater than these you can do if you understand who you are. If you rightly divide the word of truth, it will no longer be theology to you. It will be experiential. You will actually experience God living in you and operating through you. Woo. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Greater works. And why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Praise the Lord. Because we know. I don't have this kind of power. It's the Father that's in me. He does the works. And whenever you see a miracle at the hand of some human, some Christian believer, amen, it glorifies God because they know that's just dawn. Hallelujah. That's just Sally. Praise the Lord. No, that is God's son. That is God's daughter filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Given the same, an heir, a joint heir with Christ. Same power. Same anointing. Same God in an earthen vessel, in a human being. 
so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I heard somebody say this the other day. Every physical healing is spiritual. All of them. It's God. Praise the Lord. Romans 8, uh, 14 through 17, Sheila. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, or Daddy, you know, the intimate term. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen? And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be, that we may be also glorified together. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the old covenant, we're motivated by fear. That's what he's referring to here. Under the old covenant, it's all fear driven. If I don't do this, God's going to judge. Curses come. You know, if you don't do this, 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 and this. The, the consequences are this, this, and this, right? Mm -hmm. So the new covenant, we're motivated by faith, not fear. Right. We've got nothing to fear. Right. Amen? So the just will live by their faith. Mm -hmm. right. That's why we have to take people back to their true identity, back to their new identity, amen, the true identity in Christ. Right. So when we're talking to people about salvation and God, we, we, we don't have to beat them up for being, for failing, because everybody fails. Right. It's a given, right. right? The rooster crows multiple times a day, yeah. but let not your heart be troubled. And that's the message that we are to take to people, to, to, the, to the children that God wants back in his family. Right. The message of love. The message of forgiveness. The message of mercy. The message of grace. Yes. Praise the Lord. There's a, a philosopher by the name of Kierkegaard. And uh, I have a couple of books of his. But uh, one, of, one of the things that he says is life must be lived forward. But it can only be understood backwards. Mm -hmm. Now that speaks to me. I don't know about anybody else. But I understand Life, you got to keep moving. You know, I mean, you got to keep going forward because life is a, is a progressive event, right? But you really don't understand it until you look back. Yeah. I mean, when you're 20 years old or 18 years old or 17, you think you know what's going on yeah. and you're living your life. And just like with Don's granddaughter, we've all been there. Yeah. It's when you look back on your life that you see the memorials, mm -hmm. that you begin to see where God was involved in this thing. I didn't know it at the time. Maybe I didn't even understand it. Maybe I wasn't even looking for God. But now looking back, I can say, oh, that was a God thing. Yep. I mean, if that hadn't been for the Lord, I wouldn't be here or this would have happened. So that's what he's trying to say is life is lived forward, but it has to be understood backward. So 2 Timothy chapter 2.15, when, when God says, or when Paul actually is speaking by the Holy Spirit to Timothy, he says, study to show yourself approved. Study to show yourself approved. A workman who needeth not to be ashamed, mm -hmm. rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got nothing to be ashamed of. If you rightly divide this word, you're going to see that you've been approved of God. Yes. Let not your heart be troubled. Right. right? You believe in God, believe also in me. Right. Where I'm going, you're going. Amen? John chapter 20 and verse 31. Uh, John 20, verse 31. You're right. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Yes. Right? So we search the Scriptures so that we will believe, and then by believing, we will have life in Him. Right. Now, the, again, this wasn't just written so you'll understand or so you'll be convinced or be informed. It's written so that you will believe 
that there is a life-giving effect, amen, that takes place. So that you'll take in the power of resurrected life. We were buried with him. We were, we've been raised together with him. We've already experienced the crucifixion in Christ. The burial. Right? And we've been raised with him. Right. Hallelujah. That's resurrection life. Yes. But we think of resurrection life as something that's only going to happen after we're in the grave. No, we've already got resurrection life in our yes. spirit. Yes. I was thinking of my mother, my sister, uh, one of my brothers, Don's mother. They're, they're not waiting. A resurrection has already taken place. Spiritually speaking, they're already raised. The, the only thing that's ever going to get raised is a body. They're going to get a glorified body. Who they are, what they are, is already raised. It's already resurrected. It was resurrected the moment they got born again. It just had to escape a body. It just had to get away from gravity, amen, to be with the Lord again. Praise the Lord. If God was in them and they were in God, believe me, they're not laying in a tomb somewhere. It's impossible. Couldn't keep Jesus in one. They're sure, sure not going to keep anybody else in one. Amen. Not as a believer. Praise the Lord. So it's a power that gives new life. It's, it's resurrection life. It's uh, a new identity, a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Amen. It's the power of resurrection life. Changes everything. Amen. You don't have a past as far as God's concerned. You only have now. Because he's a God of the now. He doesn't live in time. He doesn't see you in time. He's known you before the foundation of the world. And he'll know you long after the world has gone away. Amen. It's a power. Praise the Lord. What we've gotten used to in religion is this simplistic, stripped-down gospel that's about you, you, you do this and do that and all of this kind of stuff. And if you do it good enough, then maybe, you know, you'll escape hell. It's a gospel that suggests that you have issues. Yeah, you know, we all got problems. But Jesus died for you, now be good. Right? You got problems, but, you know, Jesus died for you, now straighten up. Be a good person now. Now, study to show yourself a proof. Yes, right. Which says your problem is radical. Your problem is a deadly problem. And it requires radical intervention. It requires a new covenant. It requires a new identity. It requires a new life. One that only comes from a death and resurrection. That you can't perform for yourself. The level and quality of our failures, our messed upness, is complete. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all know that. Yes. It's completely messed up, yes. left to ourselves. Yes. It's exhaustive and irreconcilable yes. by us. Right. But the gift of God's grace reconciles us completely to God. In a way that can only be described as bringing the dead back to life. Yes, yes, yes. As resurrection. Yes. Let not your heart be troubled. Yes. Yeah. Our focus needs to shift from what we're saved from yep. to what we've been saved to. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. Greater works. Yes. Better blood. Better tabernacle. Yes. Better high priest. Yes. Yes. Better promises. Yes. 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 Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. We'll wrap it up with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Our focus needs to be forward by looking back to what Jesus has done. The only way you can see your future is by knowing your past has been taken care of. 
your past, your present, and your future is all in him. Yes. Praise the Lord. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us now the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now here's the deal. The people that are out there that have not accepted Christ, mm -hmm. He still paid their pri the price yeah. for their redemption. Yeah. They are not under judgment. Mm. Listen to what I'm saying. They, they're not under judgment. There will be a day where judgment will come, and it will come by the law. Jesus even told yeah. the people of His day that. He said, I didn't come to judge you. He said, there's already one here that judges you, even yeah. Moses, even the law. So at the end of this thing, in time, speaking of time-wise, when we wrap it all up, there will be a judgment. Now, we won't be judged because we've already been judged in Christ and found innocent. Yes. Right? But yes. people who have not accepted Christ, even though God has given them grace yeah. and forgiveness and mercy, unless they receive it by faith, they have to be judged yeah. by the law. It's not God condemning them. God doesn't want any to be lost. It's not His will that any should perish. Why? Because He's a good, good God. And He loves us. And that's who we are. But only if we recognize it, right? So now we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So that we, and I could just interject this in here, who have done nothing but sin... Amen. Will become the righteousness of God in Him. Yes. Praise the Lord. So if we study to show ourselves approved, when we fail, the rooster is going to crow. He always crows. He always does. But to reassure us, let not your heart be troubled. I know you're going to screw up. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But don't let it ruin you. Right. I've declared you righteous. Yes. And my yes. word is the final word. Yes. Let yes. not your heart be troubled when you fail. Do we want to fail? No, we don't want to fail, but we do. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? And when we do, don't let it trouble you. Move on. Yes. Just Continue on in your identity, in who you are. Search the scriptures. Amen. Uh, study to show yourself accepted. Yes. If you want to study something, study to show how much God loves you. Yeah. The price that he paid for you. Yeah. Study to show that you have been approved by God. Amen. You've been declared righteous. That's what you need to be studying. That's what you need to be looking at. That will change a person's life faster than all the judgment, all the criticism, all the corrections, all of the fault finding. Which leads you to, at some point to just say, what is the world trying to do here? I mean, think about the people. I know uh, having evangelized and done things like that. Uh, People give up on God because they think He's just too strict. Yeah. He's too demanding and I can't do it. Yeah. Why? Where did they get that information? Yeah. They got it from some jack -leg preacher or somebody who just didn't really understand what it was they were trying to get across. They weren't reconciling anybody to God because they had not been reconciled. Right. They hadn't been able to discern the difference yeah. between the law and grace. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Right. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. You've been approved in Christ. Wow. And He will never leave you or forsake you. Wow. We are His dwelling place. Wow. We are you, Almighty God. Yes. Oh, omniscient, Lord. omnipresent, yes. all-powerful. Yes. We're His local address. Amen. We are the, uh, what do they call those long stay hotels? What do they call them? Extended stay. 
extended stays. We are his extended stay address on planet Earth. Praise the Lord. And he's not going anywhere. He's here. Living in you. So that you can do greater works than Jesus did. So that you, his son, can glorify your father. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. See, the bottom line is this. The only thing left for us to do is the greater works. That's the truth. That's the only thing there is for us to do is lay hands on the sick. Share the gospel. Convince people of God's love for them and not his hatred or his judgment or his correction. The rooster will crow, but now the rooster ought to be a reminder to us whenever we hear the rooster crow. New day. New covenant. Hallelujah. New relationship. It's all good in God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. Every day is a good day with Jesus. Praise the Lord. He's got something special for each and every one of us. And remember the memorials. Because they'll keep you on the right path going forward. Amen. Give the Lord one more hand clap. Praise God. Amen, amen. And I almost did it perfectly to the time that I went over last week. I think it was like 15 after or something. So I really did good. I'm very pleased with myself. Yeah. I am. Because I hear the Lord saying it to me right now. Really good. Really good, Nate. Good job, Nathan. I'm going to put this on the fridge. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Hey, let's just be who we are. Amen. Relax. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. He's prepared a place for you. And that's where you're at right now. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great rest of the day.